All right, thank you latecomers um, and we will get started. So um, I'm Jennifer Posley. Thanks for, for bearing with us and for being here. Um, I am the second talk of this Pine Rockland Working Group Conference and I'm happy to uh, follow Suzanne Copter's talk this morning at, at 10, which was really uh, beautiful and interesting and I love learning more about these flowers and their pollinators, things that I see every day and don't necessarily um, know what's going on behind the scenes. I am talking to you from Fairchild Tropical Botanic Garden, which is a 83 acre tropical paradise here in Coral Gables. We, our collections focus on palms and on tropical plants from around the world. And the garden was established in 1938 with the mission of bringing tropical plants to South Florida. We were named in honor of David Fairchild, this gentleman on the left here and the garden was started by Colonel Robert Montgomery, the gentleman on the right. And back in the day in the 30s when they started this garden, um, there was no focus on native plants of South Florida. And, and these guys weren't alone. They're just very few people were interested in the native diversity right here in our own backyard. Our conservation program that focused on native plants of South Florida really got its start under Dr. John Papineau, who was one of Fairchild's longtime directors. He was on staff for 28 years, um, 1963 to 1989. And apparently towards the end of his career, Dr. Papineau really started to get more interested in native plants and conservation. He oversaw Fairchild joining the Center for Plant Conservation as a founding member. Um, in the mid 80s, he had staff that was focusing increasingly on growing native plants and selling them at plant sales to an increasingly interested public. And in 1989, he hired Carol Lippincott, whom you see here. And um, she was the garden's first full-time staffer dedicated to endangered species. In the 90s, Pine Rocklands became much more of a focus. Um, in the early days, I think the focus was on species that were not Pine Rockland, like Pseudophoenix, Sargentii, the cherry palm, the, um, the semaphore cactus, and the beech cluster vine, beech jackmantia. In the 90s, staff began to focus on our federally listed species, uh, specifically the four listed here. And we had uh, some great, some great, uh, people on our staff, like Kit Kernan, a, a couple of, a couple of bio, biology technicians by the name of Steve Woodmansey and Keith Bradley were on staff for a while. We had uh, Dina Garview, and um, they oversaw the kind of the birth of the Pine Rockland program at Fairchild. I came on the scene in uh, 2001. I was hired pretty fresh out of graduate school at University of Florida. And uh, I was hired by Dr. Cynthia Lane, who was the conservation ecologist at the time. And uh, I had the really good fortune of being around when Fairchild and Miami-Dade County decided to sign an agreement to create a position at Fairchild that focused on rare plant mapping and monitoring in all of the county preserves. Um, and I was, I got to be that person. So for 15 years, under the direction of my boss, Joyce Mashinsky, and um, working in close co coordination with the county, I just got to go around mapping and monitoring rare plants in the county preserves. And many of those were Pine Rockland plants and Pine Rockland preserves. Today we have a really um, amazing team that I'm really proud to be a part of. And these are some of the most prominent faces here that you may know, I won't introduce them all, but we, we have a really talented staff um, and some volunteers that we really couldn't live without as well. So I just wanna acknowledge them in this talk and that everything I'm saying that we do is really a team effort. 
So now I'm going to take you from the tropical paradise of Fairchild Garden into the Pine Rocklands. And uh, this is my favorite Pine Rockland picture. Lydia Cooney took this picture at Rockdale Pineland Preserve, an eel preserve, um, when she was working there on one of her, our, her current grants. And um, so in preparing for this talk, I had to think about how do I talk about all of the things we've done in the history of our conservation program for Pine Rocklands? And I really realized we've, we've, in some ways we've been all over the place. We've really done a lot. And it's kind of hard to try to think about how to um, cram it all into a 45 minute presentation. But I, I came up with five themes and that's reintroduction, seed banking, wild population monitoring, management research, and then I can't see the last one. Oh, there, connect to protect network. Um, so I'm gonna be going over a lot of information in the next 40 or so minutes, and most of it fits under these five categories. Looking at reintroductions. So we, at our conservation program, we tend to be focused on single species and the recovery of single species. Looking just at Pine Rocklands, um, since our program began, I, by my count, we've done 29 reintroductions or translocation actions of 11 different species. These are the 11 Pine Rockland species listed here. Looking at all of them on a timeline, um, you can see that we did the first one in 1995. That was with Amorpha herbacea variety crenulata, the crenulate lead plant. And we've been doing reintroductions ever since. And you can really tell that 2019, 2020, we've been very busy. So I'm just gonna go into examples of two, and I'm not gonna talk about all of these, but I wanna talk about our earliest introduction with the Amorpha and our most recent introductions, um, which had been done uh, with a program led by Lydia Cooney. All right, so starting off with the crenulate lead plant. This is our oldest introduction and it's actually 25 years old, which is, is saying something. Um, plant reintroduction in the United States and in the world is a pretty young science. So to have a project like this that's 25 years old is, um, it's, it's unusual. So Fairchild staff in 95, worked with the county to plant 190 crenulate lead plants in the Deering Estate in seven different clusters. And this is what the survival looks like. And this, this looks kind of scary at first, but this is actually pretty normal and pretty good results. Um, 25 years out, we have 31 plants surviving, that's 16%. Um, you can see that there was early mortality, but it's um, the, the rate of mortality has been decreasing. And um, the way that we really measure success in outplants like this is looking at the recruits, the next generation. So in recent years, the, at our most recent monitoring in 2020, we found 199 recruits, which sounds good, but most of them were little tiny um, thing, just little cotyledons or things with one or two leaves, and those tend to not make it to the next stage in life. Um, so this is a look at the total number of plants with this reintroduction. And this bar with the big blue spike, what this is showing is that typically when we've done our monitoring since the onset of this project, um, there have been maybe 100, 200 plants, but in 2008, there was this huge spike where we found 4,000 plants. And as you might imagine, the reason for this was because the county did a prescribed burn in this Pine Rockland in April 2008, and then we did our monitoring in August of 2008. The crenulate lead plant is heavily dependent on fire. Um, when a fire happens, it's one of the first things to, to shoot back out of the ground. It has a big starchy tuber and it has a lot of reserves it can use to come back. And it's also one of the very first things to flower and to set seed. 
So um, it's super dependent on fire and very uh, responsive to fire. It's a beautiful, beautiful show it puts on after a fire too. Um, so 2008 was the last time this preserve burned, or at last time that this, not the preserve, but this area where the crenulate lead plant is growing burned. So we like to see a fire in Pine Rocklands every two to 10 years. And that's something that's gonna be very important for the persistence of this population. And in the meantime, we're planning an augmentation because if we got 25 years out of the first one, I th certainly think it's worth um, putting in some more plants to try to keep this population at the Deering Estate. Okay. So the next project that I want to turn to is something that we did from 2018 to 2020. And this was led by Lydia Cooney. It's her sitting there under the palm trees. Um, and we were actually able to hire Lydia full time under this grant, which was great. So this project is called Partnering to Safeguard South Florida's Most Vulnerable Species. And it was funded by the Florida Forest Service and administered through FDAX. This, let's see, what this project did, it was look at five recently listed species. These were all added to the federal endangered species list as either threatened or endangered. And we were working to recover them throughout their range. A very important part of this project was seed collections. And Lydia led collections of seeds of these five species um, throughout their range. When you add together all the wild seeds and then all the seeds we were able to collect from the nursery through seed bulking, which is basically growing plants and then getting seeds out of the plants at the nursery, we had over 26,000 seeds that we got out of this project. And every single one of them was collected from a, a, um, a site where we didn't collect more than 10% of the available seed because we follow rules like that so that we don't impact the wild population. So you can see that was a lot of effort. Um, every seed collected for this project was either used directly in the project or it was stored in our seed bank here at Fairchild or in the National Seed Bank, which is in Fort Collins, Colorado. Another major part of this grant was to do introductions. And this is a summary of all of the introductions we did just for this project that Lydia was hired under. We had 13 different um, plantings or seed sowings. We ended up putting out 180 different plants of those five species and 2,980 seeds. And um, these plants went to eel preserves. These are environmentally endangered lands preserves in Miami-Dade County, uh, one Miami-Dade County Park, and the National Key Deer Refuge. And I'm just going to share with you a couple of the successes. We just had one year monitoring not too long ago. And this is a scene from Rockdale Eel Preserve where we put out 42, um, sorry, 57 plants. And one year out, 42 of them are still alive. They die back over the dry season. So it's a little bit um, nerve wracking to watch them over the dry season, but most of them came right back. And what's even more exciting is the ones that survived started to recruit new seedlings. Um, and you can see the two I circled that have colored toothpicks near them. So this is something that, that Lydia and our staff and volunteers and staff of Miami-Dade Eel have been tracking very carefully. And this is really good news. And side note, we also did a, a Brichelia seed introduction and that didn't turn out quite as well. So for this species, if we're doing another introduction, we'll be using um, whole plants, not seeds. So this is Camicrista lineata variety Kiensis. It's one of the species Suzanne mentioned in her talk today. And um, 
we put 48 plants out in National Key Deer Refuge. One year out, 36 of them are still alive. And every single plant that was under a cage is still alive. So we had an issue with this species where this one federally endangered species was being really eaten by another federally endangered species, the key deer. Um, these cages that we were able to put over plants were very effective in getting the plants to um, not only survive, but to flower and set fruit. So the plants, especially the caged plants, made lots and lots of seedlings much faster than, than I expected, or I think any of us expected. And Lydia documented 240 different recruits of this species. So this was a real roaring success. And oh, side note of this one, we also did a seed introduction and that one was quite successful as well too. It turns out this is a pretty easy species to recover compared to some of the other ones we've worked with. And then last from this project, I just want to mention um, Camasyce deltoidea subspecies Serpillum. For this species, it's really difficult to get seeds, really difficult to grow. So what we ended up doing was a seed only introduction. We had these little PVC collars that each received some seeds. And I think every single one of us kind of thought, oh, I don't know if anything's going to happen with this one. But uh, much to our surprise, we had 29 seedlings survive to a year from 320 seeds we put out. And what's even more crazy and more exciting is that those plants flowered and fruited and set seed. And those have made 54 little babies plants in National Key to Refuge. So that was another just this, I can't say enough about how pleased we are with this project. It's been um, really successful and we've learned a lot through it. So I, uh, wanted to say that uh, I'm winding up the reintroduction section, but I wanted to stop here and just think about some lessons learned about reintroductions. Um, number one is that strong partnerships with the landowners and land managers and volunteers who can potentially help you with your project are really essential. And I have to give a shout out to Pat Ceballos, who's pictured here on the far right in this picture. She, this, she really made the, this project the success it is. Um, we would not have had that success with the, the Keys Wedge Spurge without Pat. She figured out how to recognize and collect seed for us, which was no small task. And she watered plants on her own um, for weeks. So we didn't have to drive from Miami to do it. So she was really a superstar. Um, but I have, to, but Throughout everything with this project, the land managers have been very supportive and um, we've worked really well together. So aftercare, obviously, with especially when you're putting out plants, is a major factor in success with reintroductions. Uh, it sounds like a no-brainer, but there are plenty of people who think you can just put a plant out and not water it. Um, you need to pay pretty close attention to these endangered species. And then the final lesson I've learned, which is something that I, I have to give credit to uh, my former boss, Joyce Mashinsky, for really hammering this home, is that if you design your introductions as an experiment and keep careful records, then even if everything dies, you'll still have learned something. So a failure isn't a failure if you um, plan well and document what you're doing. All right, so that's reintroductions. And I'm gonna move into um, thinking about what our seed banking and seed research program do for Pine Rocklands. And I'm taking you now to the seed lab, which is managed by Dr. Sabina Wintergerst. And that's her here with our high school interns last year, Janae and Melissa. Um, and I have to thank Savina for preparing these slides for me. So I wanted to talk about why and how our seed lab conserves pine rockland species. And the why is that conserving seeds is really the most cost effective way to conserve genetic material. Um, that takes up almost no space. It's, you can put thousands of genetic lines into a tiny little area. 
Um, it just makes a lot of economic sense. Seeds can be withdrawn from our bank and used at any time, at any time for research, reintroductions, um, or just to grow for our Connect to Protect network. And the seed research that we do in the seed lab provides really valuable information into the biology of these species. And I believe I have a couple, oh yeah, a summary slide. So these beautiful pictures were taken in Fairchild's um, imaging lab by Mr. Jack Hahn. These are really fantastic. And we have more of these on our website, I think. But to summarize what's going on with pine rocklands in our seed lab, we have more than 70 species stored in a freezer and it's just a typical freezer like you would keep in your garage if you had a garage. Um, we have more than 100,000 seeds in long-term freezer storage. And we've done germination experiments with more than 90 species. So that's more than 90 species where we've figured out how to get them to germinate, um, whether or not they store, trying to figure out some aspect of their seed biology. So, one example is the Smalls milk pea. This is a federally endangered species, and we've had over 8,000 seeds in our seed lab. This year, Sabina withdrew some seeds that were stored 12 years ago in 2008, just to see if they were viable. And they were very, very doing very well. These seeds were collected in 2008 from an eel preserve called Navy Wells, and their viability is still really high, which is great. So we can use these seeds to put in, um, in Fairchild. We can keep them for seed banking more seeds because seeds don't live forever in the seed bank. You do have to keep replenishing them. Or we can use them for our Connect to Protect network. And uh, this picture on the right is a picture Al Sunshine sent me of the Galactia smallii we gave him that's flowering in his yard. Okay, now here's an, an example that is looks at some of the crazy seed science. Um, Blodgett's silverbush or Argethamnia blodgettii is a species that was added to the federal list of threatened species just a couple years ago. And it's one that we've always had uh, trouble germinating. We've, it's always done very low numbers. Um, even if you soak it in hot water overnight, which is the way we get many of our seeds to germinate, the germination is still not more than about 15%. So Savina kind of decided to attack this species and see if we could get it to germinate better. Um, she found that potassium nitrate would get germination to about 50%. And then she decided that wasn't good enough. So she needed, she, I, th I think she tried a bunch of other things too, but the thing that, turned out to be really significant for this species was smoke water. And she actually burned pine needles, bubbled the smoke through um, a tube and into a beaker, and then used that water to treat the seeds. And that was really the secret. She got 80% um, germination on a notoriously difficult to germinate species with this smoke water. And that, to me, that just shows you there's so many ways that the, the pine rockland species are dependent on fire and smoke. We don't even understand um, all of the ways in which they're dependent. And I have to put in a little plug for Sabina and Brian's virtual field trip, which is going to be in one week from today. That's just going to be a fun 10 minute look behind the scenes at the seed lab and in our nursery. So uh, sign up for that. Okay, next wild population monitoring. All right, now we're really gonna get out there in some of the preserves uh, and tell you about population monitoring. In my mind, this is some of the most critical conservation work we do. Um, you have to be out there in the field looking at what's happening with these plants. Um, so you know before it's too late when you need to act. So we do this in very close collaboration with land managers, especially those at Miami-Dade County's Environmentally Endangered Lands Program and Natural Areas Management Division. And I do wanna give a shout out to um, local experts that we really rely on. And 
that's especially, especially the Institute for Regional Conservation. Um, we use their, their plant inventory database on a daily basis and the knowledge in the head of George Gann and his staff um, is really important to us as well. So I'm just gonna give two examples of species that we do have done long-term population monitoring. Um, and both of these show a decrease in the population over time due to fire suppression and habitat loss. So um, the story for most pine rockland species is that of uh, diminishment over time. And these two are certainly representative of that. So I'm gonna go back to the crenulate lead plant, Amorpha. So this, this, I talked previously about our efforts to reintroduce the species to the Deering estate. There are wild populations that we also monitor. And in the past 20 years, since I've been working at Fairchild, we lost three populations of this species, including the, the largest and perhaps most important population was developed and it's now a $5 car wash on Bird Road. Um, there are now two populations remaining and they're in county preserves that as far as I understand it don't have dedicated funding for these plants and they suffer from high public use. Um, Tropical Park and AD Barnes Park are two of the highest used parks in the county their, their um, Santa's Enchanted Forest is almost right on top. And yeah, it's really called Santa's Enchanted Forest. It's, it's almost right on top of the crenulate lead plant population. Um, just the amount of, of trash alone from public use is concerning to me at Tropical Park. And um, A.D. Barnes Park and Tropical Park both have a slew of issues and I just chose to highlight feral cat feeding, which has um, negative impacts on a lot of the ecosystem, including us humans who try to monitor. Um, it, it really increases the population of raccoons. There's been problems with rabies outbreaks um, and it just becomes a not safe situation. But anyway, going back to, to the lead plant. So this is a federally listed um, legume it's endemic to Miami. We did lose three populations and there are two populations left. So looking from 2011 to 2019, when we did our last monitoring, the total number of plants has gone from 1300 to just 200. Obviously that's uh, quite concerning. And Miami-Dade County is concerned about this too. It's a really difficult place to burn, unfortunately. And you saw earlier that this species is really dependent on fire, but there's schools, there's homes, there's hospitals, there's the Palmetto Expressway. Um, this is as urban as it gets. And in addition to the difficulty of creating a smoke situation, there's the problem that the place is so fire suppressed in areas that it won't burn. So this year, the county took the drastic step of manually removing some sable palm trees and hardwood trees. And I think this was, this was concerning to some of the neighbors, but they did a good job of um, advertising why they were doing it. And uh, it significantly changed the habitat, opened up a lot of light, and they were even able to do a prescribed fire, which is um, a really huge accomplishment in, in one of these parks. We have not done our complete monitoring census that we do every year. We're going to be doing that next month. Um, but we've been out to check on the plants just quickly. The crenulate lead plant are responding really well. They're flowering just like they do after a burn um, and setting lots of fat little seeds um, out. Unfortunately, the 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 weeds are really coming back too, as everybody knew what happened, but it, this is kind of, you're kind of, uh, you know, there's not a great solution. So the county has to stay on top of the weeds and hopefully be able to burn um, because that's what's going to be most effective for everything. 
And then the other species I wanted to highlight that we have long-term monitoring data for is the tiny polygola. This is a little um, endemic to South Florida. It's in the, the polygolaceae, the milkwort family. And it only grows in scrub, flatwoods, and pine rocklands that have quartz sand. It's one of the only annual species we work with, and that makes it a bit of a challenge. It's um, not like we can keep it growing in the nursery in pots for a long time and collect seeds off it. It's more difficult than some of our other species in that way. Um, so we've lost a lot of populations of this to fire suppression. Um, the ones that I'm aware of are at the Burger King, former Burger King headquarters, which is now the village of Palmetto Bay headquarters. There's a retirement village that used to have a population, the executive airport at Fort Lauderdale. Um, I believe it may have disappeared from an FPL easement at Ludlam, Pine Rocklands. And then uh, we may have lost it at the Deering Estate. We haven't seen it there since 2014. Although hopefully um, it will come back if there's a prescribed fire because I do believe it, per it um, persists in the seed bank. So populations of tiny polygo that, that remain are in Martin County and Palm Beach County. There's one little population in an eel preserve called Pine Shore. And then the mother load is in the Richmond Pine Rocklands. This is where the most plants in the world of this cute little plant um, grow. And I just wanted to highlight our work with mapping the species at the US Coast Guard Communication Station. It's especially cool because we have really long-term data set. Um, looking at this map, we have data from 1993. And I believe that was mapped by Keith Bradley when he worked for DERM. Um, and you can see here that the blue, the darker blue polygons that Keith um, mapped show a much bigger area than the red dots that we did today, that we did in last year. Um, we mapped, Lydia and myself mapped these. We found about 200 plants in the last year. In 1993, Derm in working with Keith found uh, over 1,500 plants. But then the crazy thing is that Fairchild found more than 10,000 plants in 2008. That was really a boom year. I don't know why. Um, and it just goes to show you that this these populations can go up and down. But one thing's for certain is that the footprint is shrinking of this species. Um, there is hope though with the species in, in the Coast Guard property because the staff at the US Coast Guard station there is really supportive of a prescribed burn. They are all for it um, in making that happen. And Fish and Wildlife Service is also on board and they're going to be funding some restoration in there as they have in the past. And um, that will be hopefully done by the IRC in the next year. And they're by far the best people to do it. Okay, so I'm gonna talk a little bit now about some of the research we've done with Pine Rockland management. And I'm just gonna look at three projects quickly. I'll just touch on kind of the most interesting pieces of each one of these three projects, all of which we've published. So here's citations. And um, I think these are most, these are on our website too, on our Fairchild website. So first, I want to take a look at this publication from Natural Areas Journal in 2014 that's called a Ve Vegetation Monitoring to Guide Management Decisions in Miami's Urban Pine Rockland Preserves. Um, you can tell I kind of ran out of steam putting pictures on my slideshow at this point, but uh, I have highlighted the three things that I think are the most important takeaway from this, this project, which and in this, in this work, we compared the conditions in Pine Rockland preserves all over Miami-Dade County. They were all county-owned preserves. And we looked at, at preserves that were very fire suppressed or ones that were kind of middle of the road and preserves that had had quite a bit of burning. 
we show a really strong correlation between frequent fire and higher native plant diversity, including higher abundance of some of our um, more important pine rockland indicator species. We also, and I think this is the, the most important part of this paper, we worked with natural areas management to compare restoration costs per hectare for the different types of pine rockland. And I have a couple examples. So this is, um, in my opinion, the best or one of the best parts, pa parcels of pine rockland in the whole Miami-Dade County system. This is the Southwest Management Unit at Larry and Penny Thompson Park. It's burned very frequently and the cost for the county to do a prescribed fire in this area is about $200 an acre. Very reasonable. And it's because it's in such great shape already. The fire is very easy. It's very safe and there's minimal um, prep that's needed. And here's on the other end of the scale, what's needed when you take a very fire suppressed pineland that's starting to become a hardwood forest and try to turn it back into a pine rockland. At this point, um, a pine rockland like this will not burn. You can throw a bunch of matches in this preserve. They're not going to take that. It's just no longer a community that carries fire. Um, so people have to go in and by hand take out all of the hardwoods and sometimes palm trees and pine trees even in order to get the area to, to be burnable. So the cost to do this in one area of Camp Owasa Bower was almost $6,000 a hectare. Um, so economics alone prescribed burning makes a lot of sense. And from I think my presentation and Suzanne's earlier, it obviously makes a lot of ecological sense. Oh, and I just wanted to put in a, a picture of what that area looks like today. It looks pretty rough after um, the county goes through and takes out the hardwoods in order to get it to a burnable state. But this is what it looks like a couple years later. And if you have a really good computer screen in front of you, you can see that there's the Gould's Wedge sand mat all over the place in this area. And um, the vegetation in the herbaceous layer is quite diverse. It's a complete 180 from what it looked like before. And this will burn. This will actually carry a fire. Okay, I next wanted to mention the Richmond Management Plan. And this is a rewrite of the first Richmond Management Plan that was put out in I think 1995. And this is online on Fairchild's website. If you go to um, our website and look up, I think you go to science and then native plant conservation, it's on that page. Um, even if you don't wanna read the plan, I highly, highly recommend you check it out because it's got some really great resources as far as maps and photos. This is one of my favorite maps. This is a look at the Richmond Pine Rocklands in 1938 with today's property boundaries overlain. And what most of this is, is Pine Rockland. And if you can see my cursor, this is a Marl Prairie here that was later dug out to be the lakes in Larry and Penny. Um, it goes up through Martinez and kind of splits in two. And then there's a, just a little tiny piece of a Marl Prairie that kind of went down 152nd Avenue and then turned south at 117th Avenue, and that, which is probably why those roads were put where they were. Um, <clears throat> so it's just, it's pretty, uh, uh, it really puts it in perspective. Here's another map. This is a look at all of the federally listed species that have been documented by Fairchild and County and other staff um, over the years. And um, there are color plates of the federally listed species, the life cycle of the South Florida slash pine, um, rare species that are critically imperiled but not federally listed, and invasive pest plants. So there's um, 
it's, it's just a good resource if you're looking to learn about pine rocklands and specifically the Richmond pine rocklands. So what this plan really does is pull together all the data we have about the Richmond pine rocklands, including the rare species, um, the best management practices, the laws, some of the, the local, state, and federal laws that are pertinent to what goes on in Pine Rocklands. Um, it does not compel anyone to follow it. This is just a, this, just a management plan that sits alone, and it, it doesn't lay the groundwork for better communication and coordination. Um, we know we need to make that happen outside of this plan. So um, I'd like to say it would have been in 2020, but it kind of got away from us. And we're um, planning to convene a stakeholder meeting in, in October of 2021 to try to get all the different land managers on the same page and to talk about how to get fire on the ground in these Pine Rocklands in this incredibly difficult to burn area. Okay, the last study I wanted to mention is um, something that kind of uh, is a departure from looking at endangered plants, but this is a study we, we did with the University of Florida and specifically with Dr. Stephen Enloe here, um, looking at the control of Burma reed. Dr. Enloe is the director of the Center for Aquatic and Invasive Plants at University of Florida which also happens to be where I um, went to grad school and graduated from. And uh, we reached out to him to help us figure out a better way to control Burma reed, which is the number one worst invasive species in Pine Rocklands. And uh, he and his students in his lab were awesome. <clears throat> Most of you are probably familiar with Burma reed. It, can take over a pine rockland like nothing else, completely change the ecosystem and crowd out all the herbs in the understory. The county had come up with a really great and a very effective way to kill large stands. And that was to cut down, cut them down at the ground, wait for the growth to reflush. And that um, new growth is drawing all of the stored starch out of the incredible, um, rhizomes that this thing has, and then they spray that with Roundup. But they reached out to us, and specifically Joe McGuire from Natural Areas Management reached out to us to try to help them find a, um, a method that could kill a plant in one treatment. Um, and I will, this ended up being a two-year study that had a nursery component followed by a field component, um, but I'll just skip right to the results and tell you that Glyphosate or Roundup was a very effective at 50%. And we also found that two graminicides or grass specific herbicides were also quite effective at very low rates of about 5%. Um, so that was fluazifop and cethoxidim. I think that's fun to say. Um, so what we found out was, or what, what I, I guess what I'm trying to say is this, at, actually ended up being very fortuitous timing and it wasn't done on purpose, but the study came out right around the same time the county instituted a countywide ban on glyphosate. So we had people suddenly with this alternative and even possibly more effective way to kill Burma reed right when the, the, the method that they used to use was taken away from them. And I wanted to point out too that um, uh, using herbicides in natural areas can be a really important and effective way to restore them. And I wanted to include this picture here of Rashid Bradley from Miami-Dade. He's applying a little bit of herbicide to some cut stems, and it's li literally just a couple of drops of chemical. Um, and that is able to kill that plant and then let pine rockland species come up in its place. All right, so we're getting to the last part of my Pine Rocklands milestones, and I can't um, not talk about our Connect to Protect network. So this 
Connect to Protect Network was started in 2007 by Joyce Mashinsky. And um, the mission is really to inspire South Florida to plant native pine rockland plants in their yards and schools in order to connect the few remaining fragments of pine rockland. So looking at this map here, um, we all had been working for years in the preserves, which are the teeny, teeny, teeny little green dots um, scattered across the Miami Rock Ridge. But knowing all the while that we need to be doing more and reaching outside of those green dots and trying to get some pine rockland, <clears throat> pine rockland species um, into that urban matrix. The way this network works is that Every member receives a free five plant starter kit. They come pick it up from us. Um, you're, you get educational opportunities and pre-pandemic, we used to have bio blitzes and nature walks, which hopefully we'll be doing again. And we have a citizen science component. And the network is managed by Daniela Champney. And I have a socially, well, not, not socially distanced, but um, masked picture of Daniela and Sabina, our seed lab manager, bringing plants up front to distribute to new members. And then the plants are grown by Brian Harding, shown here, and his team of volunteers like Mary Jackson, who spend hours and hours each week propagating these beautiful plants. And in this picture, I think they're propagating um, Pineland Sage, the wild lantana. So we, we've had a few citizen science initiatives um, and the way we handle most of them is doing email polls and surveys. We have our, our membership database is geo-referenced. So we're actually able to map people's responses if we, if we wish to do so. And I just wanted to mention um, something really exciting is that we over, over a couple of years made an effort to educate our members about how to identify the Florida dusky wing. And it's not easy to do because there's another species called the Horace's dusky wing that looks super similar. You have to, you basically have to get a picture of this butterfly with its wings spread and then compare the dots on the wings to um, an ID guide to be certain. Or um, a better way to be certain is to look for larvae eating the locust berry in your yard. And uh, we've been pushing this information out, not really knowing whether something would happen, but we have had two, now I think three different members um, report finding this species in their yard eating the locust berry. And each one of these members lives near the Richmond Pine Rocklands. So that's been very exciting for us. And it's been exciting for the butterfly researchers as well, who up until this point were not aware that um, these butterflies were traveling out of the preserves and, and doing so successfully. And then Connect to Protect Network, I've got to say, even if, even if we had no citizen science component, um, we're getting people to plant native plants in their yard. And I just had a couple of examples. This is Al Sunshine has a tiny little planting that he did in his neighborhood, in his, in his home. Um, this is Eduardo Verona. He put this planting together amazingly fast and he's got beautiful rocks and rock outcroppings. It's gorgeous. He's been posting pictures of his blooming um, Ipomoea microdactyla that's going crazy. And then here's the, um, the graminoid focused planting of Raul Moes and with him and his wife in their Pinecrest yard. And um, just getting our members to do plantings like this. And we now have, we estimate almost, almost 900 gardens. Um, and the, I'm, I'm only showing you the best ones. Some of them aren't this uh, amazing and diverse, but um, it's, it's really, it's really a, uh, a coup to be, to be getting people excited about doing this. So if you wanna learn more about the Connect to Protect network, 
this is the website and I do know that our manager Daniela Champney is on the chat too so if you have any questions you can ask her directly in the chat so um I've made it through my attempts to organize what we do into five different categories um hopefully it was successful it's it's hard it's it's kind of like a tornado and trying to pull things out of it um, and explain to everybody else what we're doing. It's, we're so busy. Um, I wanted to go over again, some of the lessons I learned that I've learned in my career here that I think are important to reiterate. Um, I've got to reiterate the one about experimentation. Always, always design your, your studies your reintroductions or your field studies as an experiment, keep good records, then there can be no failure. Um, something else I've, I've learned over the years is that language matters and word choice can matter a lot. Uh, I spent years calling the, the, the parks that where we work sites. Say, I'm going to this site, I'm going to that site. Um, the previous director of EEL really hammered home they, they aren't sites, they're preserves. They're nature preserves that are full of plants and animals. So I have to thank uh, Cynthia Guerra for kind of turning me onto that idea that, that that language can matter. And then I also um, really object to the word degraded. I think degraded pine rockland or what's even worse, vacant land is just a terrible choice of language and it makes it sound like there's no other choice but to bulldoze a pineland. And it's not true at all. Just because a pine rockland has some disturbed soil or some invasive species, it's just a pine rockland that needs restoration. It's not degraded land, not vacant land. And then finally, um, something I've learned as I've gone along and gotten a little older and worked with more and more people is how important it is to be inclusive and collaborative. Um, it just doesn't make any sense to stay in your, in your silo, as they call it, and keep doing what you're doing. We, the projects that we do, that we do with other people, whether they're in our um, ecology universe or outside of it, those are the projects that are much more meaningful and have more staying power. Um, so the more allies, the better, and we should always be looking for partners who can help to improve a project and make it more fun along the way. So thinking about the future of Pine Rocklands, it's, um, it's, it's not from this point a sunny picture in some ways. Um, they've been on the losing end for too long, but I know there are a lot of really good people, including everyone in the audience here who are rooting for Pine Rocklands and we have to work together to not lose any ground. We can only be gaining ground from this point on because there's just about 1% left in the Miami area. Um, so let's work together to teach, learn and appreciate. And I have to say, not all of us are in a position to be able to hold developers, politicians and landowners accountable for their choices. But if you're in a position where you're able to do that you don't have to worry about um, offending your your um, job or your boss or your coworkers. Um, that's something really wonderful that you can do for Pine Rocklands, and it's I I want to say thank you to those of you who are in that position to be able to do that and who do um, call out politicians and developers for their actions. So. Um, that's it. I want to end with Lydia's beautiful Pine Rockland picture. I think it's one o'clock exactly. I'll stop screen sharing and I'll take questions for about 10 or 15 minutes um, live. And then I'm going to uh, turn off and get ready for the next talk, which is going to be at two o'clock today with 